Ecclesiastes chapter number 11. And you know, hearing, hearing the prayer requests again, I know we have these on the, the uh, prayer list, but just hearing afresh and anew that burden for many families. Uh, let's, let's pray. Let's really pray and get a hold of God and claim these families this year, 2018. Let's ask the Lord to work uh, in such a way that we can see God uh, just turn some of these situations around. And uh, we want to give Him all the credit and all the praise for everything He does. And so let's just pray for those things this year. Let's claim those things. And Ecclesiastes chapter 11. And uh, we started Ecclesiastes 11 a couple of weeks ago. And uh, tonight we'll finish Ecclesiastes 11. Next week, Lord willing, we'll complete the book of Ecclesiastes. And just a reminder about the entire book. Over and over again, Solomon mentioned how that life lived under the sun without the Lord is vanity and vexation of spirit. He said, listen, if you're living just for this life, you're living for all you can get out of this life, you're going to find yourself empty. You're going to find yourself wanting. You're going to find yourself lacking. And so uh, all through the book, we, we hear him saying two phrases over and over again, under the sun, and everything under the sun is vanity and vexation of spirit. And uh, we saw that theme all throughout. And Ecclesiastes chapter 10, we saw the comparison of wisdom versus foolishness and how much better wisdom is than foolishness. And then the last time we were in Ecclesiastes, we began Ecclesiastes 11 and we saw uh, what the Bible has to say about giving. And it's an amazing thing. Uh, what, the Scripture has a lot to say about giving. Now when we think of giving, we, the first thing we think of is money. Now that is included in giving. But there are a whole lot of other things you can give and that you should give. We can give the gospel, and we should give the gospel. Uh, we can give encouragement, and we should give encouragement. Uh, we can give time. That's one of the most valuable things you can give someone is your time. Uh, when you give someone your time, you're giving them something you can't give to anyone else. And so uh, time is something you give. Uh, th there's just so much that we can look at when it comes to giving. So don't just lock into this one thought of, giving financially or giving materially. Uh, those things do apply. But think of, of how God would have you to be a giver. Uh, as I've said last time, uh, many folks, when they read about giving, they think, well, how can others give to me? Folks, that's no way to live. It really isn't. The best thing that we can do is come and think, how can I be giving to others? Uh, when somebody comes to church and they come to church and they say, well, I hope somebody will encourage me today. I understand that desire. That's okay. But can I tell you something that will make you happier, something that will bless you even more, is if you'll come to church saying, who can I encourage today? You can't control who will encourage you, but you can control whether or not you reach out to someone else. And so I want to encourage you to be a giver. Be a giver. That's what Jesus Christ was. He's a giver, and He is a giver. Amen. Acts chapter 20, verse 35, the Bible says, Jesus said, it's more blessed. You'll be more happy. You really will. If you give than to receive. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Ephesians 4.28, we saw that we're to labor with our hands. Why? So we may have to give to Him that needed. It's so important to give. Uh, and then we saw in a, uh, chapter 11, verse 2, the Bible says give a portion to seven and also to eight. What is He saying? He's saying, listen, uh, just give everywhere you have the opportunity. If you have the opportunity, you have the means, give of yourself. Uh, you, you give to seven, you plan to give to seven, and an eighth situation comes, give to that one too. Uh, be a giver. Find a way to give of yourself. And uh, again, thinking selfishly, folks would look at verse 2 and they'd say, well, this is teaching diversification of investing. Well, that is a good principle when it comes to investing to diversify. But he's not talking about investing in yourself. He's talking about investing in others. And he's saying, diversify your giving. Find find." Every way you can. Be creative with your giving. Proverbs chapter 3. In fact, let's look at this one very quickly. Proverbs chapter 3. Keep your finger in Ecclesiastes. Look at verse 27. The Bible says, Withhold not good from them to whom it is due when, that's an important word, when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. In other words, while you have the opportunity to give, do it. Because the day may come you won't have the opportunity now that's not just talking about, again, it's not just talking about money. It's talking about, let's take the gospel. Uh, 
God gives you an opportunity to give the gospel to someone. Don't sit back and hold the gospel to yourself and say, well, I'll have a better opportunity. I'll have another time, another chance. You don't know that you will. So give it when it's in the power of your hand to do it. Uh, encouragement. God speaks to your heart to encourage somebody, to give somebody a good word. Don't put that off. Give that word of encouragement right when God tells you to do it. You just never know how that one little word of encouragement could just help someone to go on and grow for God. You just never know. So what the Bible says, very important word, withhold not good from them to whom it is due when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. Say not unto thy neighbor, <clears throat> go and come again, and tomorrow I will give when thou hast it by thee. When you can give, do it. When God gives you an opportunity to give, do it. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we won't look at the whole passage. Uh, we won't look at the passage tonight, but that's all about giving and sowing sparingly. If you sow sparingly, if you plant sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. If you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. Uh, back in Ecclesiastes 11, look at verse number 3. The Bible says that the clouds be full of rain. They empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree fall toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. Don't say, uh, I, I'll, I'll be a blessing and I'll give when I'm in this place. No, instead, the place you're in right now, whether it be financially or physically or geographically, the place you're in right now, you find a way to give in that place. Uh, find, uh, find the opportunity God has put in front of you right now. Don't wait. Don't wait and say, well, there's a better opportunity. No, verse 3, if the clouds are full of rain, what do they do? They give. If you have an opportunity where you are, when you have the opportunity, give. Look at Ecclesiastes 11.4. He that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. Don't make much of objections. Don't make much of difficulties. Don't make much of hardships. Don't magnify those things. Those are part of life. Troubles are part of life. Difficulties are part of life. Uh, obstacles are part of life. We can use obstacles as an excuse not to do what God's led us to do, but instead we should realize those obstacles might be the very way that God uses to help us do all we can for Christ. Verse 4, He that observeth the wind shall not sow. A farmer can't go outside and go, well, I think it's kind of windy, so uh, it might not be perfect, uh, perfect weather for planting, so I'm not going to plant. He can't do that. He, has, he doesn't have that option. He just has to go out there and plant. Verse 4, he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. Now verse 5, I believe this is where we left off. Let's begin verse 5. As thou knowest not, what is the way of the Spirit? Nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child. Even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. In the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thine hand. For thou knowest not whether shall prosper either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. Lord, speak to our hearts. Give us what we need tonight from your word. Help us, Lord. And, uh, Lord, may you have our full attention. In Jesus' name, amen. Look at 1 Corinthians. Keep your finger here, please. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. While you're turning there, I'm going to read these verses to you again. It says, As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. Does a, does a couple make the baby grow? No, God does that. God, God does that. And there's just an amazing thing of how God's creation, how God makes a, a little child to grow. And, and uh, by the way, that's why a child is a child from the moment of conception. They're, they're, it's not after a certain number of weeks. They're a child from the moment of conception. Before you can even tell a hand or a face, they're a child. Their members are all written in God's book, the Scripture says. But God is the one who makes that child to grow. In verse 6 it says, it, it uses the analogy of farming. It says, in the morning, sow thy seed. And in the evening withhold not thine hand, for thou knowest not whether shall prosper either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. If you go out and plant seeds, do you know which seed is going to spring forth and grow? You don't. You don't know if that one will or if that one will or if they both will. You don't. That's not up to you. That's up to God. The only thing up to you is to plant the seed. That's your job. 
Your job is to get out and plant the seed and give. That's, notice what the scripture says, 1 Corinthians 3. It's talking about soul winning. And it says, I have planted, Paul said, Apollos watered. But who gave the increase? Verse 6. God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. You're going to be rewarded by the Lord according to your labor. Not according to other people's labor, but according to your labor. You're not going to be rewarded according to your results. The results are up to God. You're going to be rewarded according to the labor God's left you to do. And verse 9, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. Look at Psalm 126, 5 and 6. Again, when we talk about giving, it's not just financial giving. It's giving of the gospel. It's giving of encouragement. It's giving help to people. It's giving of your time. Look at Psalm 126, verse 5. The Bible says, They that sow... Again, a farmer planting seeds. It's that kind of sowing. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. When you go out soul winning, do you know who's going to get saved before you go out? You don't. In fact, many times we misjudge this. Many times we, we profile people. We say, well, I don't think they're really ready. And folks, we, we can be so wrong. We can be so mistaken. Right. I've told that story before of the fellow who came and sat in the back of church when we were over the fellowship hall in about three rows of chairs over there. He sat in the back and, and the whole service, he had his arms crossed, just looked at me kind of like this, the whole service. You know. Well, it was Saturday. Saturday rolled around. I thought, well, I need to go talk to him about the Lord. And... Um, well, I don't think he wants to hear from me, though. I can tell him just the way he was in church. I went by there, and what did he say? He said, come on in. And he got saved in his apartment. I, I ended up working with him for a couple of years. What about, uh, Quentin Johns worked with him for a few years. The, the fact is, you just don't know. You don't know who's going to get saved and who's not going to get saved. You don't know which tract is going to prosper. You don't know which tract you leave uh, on the bench at the mall and, or wherever is going to get someone saved. You don't know. <coughs> So just sow the seed everywhere you go. That's what he's saying. Just sow the seed. Every opportunity is a great opportunity to get the gospel out. Look at Proverbs. And what will happen? You will reap in joy. Look at Proverbs chapter 19. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 17. Proverbs 19, verse 17. This applies financially as well. Notice what it says. He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord. And that which he hath given, will he pay him again? That's either true or it isn't. And it is true. Yeah. Now, it may not come to you in the way you think it should or when you think it will, but if you will cast your bread upon the waters, as the Scripture says, it will return unto you after many days. It will. Give and it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. It will happen. Now, as I said before, I believe your motive matters. I don't believe you should go out looking to give and immediately expecting God to hand, put something in your hand. I think you should go out with the same heart Jesus did. That is just to give and leave the results to God. Look at Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, look at verse number 12. Luke chapter 14, verse number 12. Again, speaking of giving and being a blessing to others. Luke, Luke 14, verse 12. This is very practical. It, it, that we speak of this supper spiritually and we can apply it to the gospel feast, the gospel supper, but he's talking about an actual supper. He's talking about an actual dinner. And notice what he says, verse 12. Jesus had been invited to a supper. Jesus says to the man who invited him, verse 12, Then said he also to him that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends. Was well, there anything wrong with getting with your friends? No, I think you should from time to time. Nor thy brethren, Neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. Tit for tat, this for that. You take us out, we'll take you out. We, we have you over for dinner, you have us over for dinner. Now, I don't think Jesus is upset with us going to dinner at our relative's house. I don't think that's the, the teaching here. But the point is this. 
Don't just give to those that you expect to receive a return from those folks. Don't, don't just give to people that you think can give back to you. No, in fact, seek out people that you don't think you'll ever see anything come back. Right. That's what Jesus is teaching. Verse 13, But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee. For thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. We're to give, the Bible teaches. We're to learn to give, and we're to learn to give uh, unselfishly. We're to learn to give and never expect anything in return. Uh, look back in Ecclesiastes 11, verse 6 again. Or I'll read it. It says, In the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thine hand, for thou knowest not whether shall prosper either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. What is he saying? He's saying scatter the seed and leave the results up to God. Scatter the seed. Uh, don't do it for reward. Do it for the Lord. Don't say, Lord, I'm going to give this. Lord, this missionary needs this. So, Lord, I'm going to give this, but now I'm expecting a return. Don't give that way. Uh, don't say, well, Lord, I'm winning souls, so I hope you're watching, Lord, because you owe me now. No, don't do it for reward. Do it for the Lord. Will God reimburse you? Will God pay you back? Many times over He will. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. This, this comes to the heart of our motive. What's the reason you give? Why do you win souls? Why do you give uh, alms? Why do you uh, give of your time or of encouragement? Make sure your motive is right. Look at Ephesians 6 verse 5. It's talking to servants or employees with, with the relationship they have with their employers. Look at verse 5. It says, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters <clears throat> according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of heart. Now, what are those next three words? Notice what it says. As unto Christ. When you make a dinner for somebody, you, you give a cup of cold water only in the name of, if even only in the name of the disciple. Who are you really giving it to? And who should you in your mind be giving it to? Unto Christ. As unto Christ. Well, we brought in some of those kids on the bus, and they came, and but they, boy, they just they didn't appreciate what the church did for them on that day. Is that why we did it? So they'd appreciate what we did for them? Did, did, did we go out soul winning so that somebody would say, hey, you did a good job. You, you did a great job. Is that why we did it? Or did we do it because we're doing it as unto Christ? Don't do it for reward. Do it for the Lord. God tells you to encourage somebody. Don't do it so that men will see you and applaud. Do it because you know it's what God would have you to do. Look at verse 6. Not with eye service. Don't do it because of what people see. As men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Why do you do what you do? Do it as to the Lord, not to men. But we know something. What do we know? Verse 8. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. You will reap what you sow. And that's not just for bad things. That's for good things. Amen. When you give, it will be returned to you. The Lord can give far more to you than you could ever give to Him. Now let's go back to Ecclesiastes 11. We'll finish this chapter. Ecclesiastes 11, verse number 7. I spent some time on this Sunday night. Now what, he is, uh, what the, uh, uh, Solomon is focusing on is a young man. He says, listen to the young. He said, you need to remember some things so you won't regret some things. Remember so you won't regret. Look at verse 7. Truly the light is sweet, and a pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the sun. But if a man live many years and rejoice in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness, for they shall be many. All that cometh is vanity. He said, listen, remember the days of darkness. Said, Pastor, what's he talking about? He's talking about old age, but he's also talking about the end of your opportunity on this life. Look at James chapter 4. Again, we looked at this Sunday night. Look at James chapter 4. This life is an opportunity. It's, it's our chance to show our love to God. Uh, God's already proven His love to us. This one life we have is our opportunity to prove our love for God. Look at James chapter 4 again. 
Verse 13, the Bible says, Go to now ye that say, Today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good. Again, what's the tense? The tense is today. The tense is when God puts an opportunity in front of you today. Whether it's to give the gospel. Or to give alms. Or to give a meal. Or to give an encouragement. Or to, to, to give friendship. Whatever it is. Whatever God's put in front of you today to give. Don't wait on it. Give it today. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not. To him it is sin. Back in Ecclesiastes he's saying, listen, young men, young lady, go ahead and enjoy your life. But remember the days of darkness, they're coming. What's he talking about? He's talking about that your life. Even if you live a long time, it'll soon be over. Again, as we talked about Sunday night, uh, I can look, I'm not that old, but I can look back on things and go, oh, man, that was 25 years ago. Other folks can go, well, that was 50 years ago. I remember that like it was yesterday. That was 60 years ago. I remember it like it was yesterday. What is he saying? He's saying, listen, your life, even if it's long in, in this world's economy, it will soon be over. It's just a vapor. It appears for a little time. So don't waste your opportunity. Make every day count for the Lord. And then he's talking specifically to young men. Verse 9, he says, Rejoice, O young man, young lady, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. Therefore remove sorrow from thy heart, and put away evil from thy flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity. What is he saying? He's saying your youth will soon be over. The strength that comes with youth. The beauty that comes with youth. The unique opportunities and advantages and pleasures that come with youth will soon be over. They'll, they're here and they're gone. So instead of wasting them living for the world, speaking to the youth, he's saying, listen, invest your youth. Invest your youth in serving the Lord. Invest your youth so you won't have regrets. Look at Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1. Remember now, thy Creator, in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. And then if you go through Ecclesiastes 12, he's talking about old age. We'll look at that next week. What is he saying? He's saying, remember right now, in your youth, remember with those those wonderful years of youth, remember the Lord and use your opportunity of youth for the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't wait until you're, uh, don't wait until you're an adult. Serve God now with your youth. What is He teaching us in this whole chapter, Ecclesiastes 11? Here, here's the bottom line. We can sum it all up. Here's what He's saying to all of us. Use the opportunities God has put in front of you today. Don't sit here wishing that you had some other opportunity. Don't, don't waste the one God's put in front of you now. There are certain situations you maybe wish you could change in life. You're not in control. I'm not in control. But God has put opportunities in front of you today to give the gospel, to give encouragement, to give alms, to give a strength to somebody, to give friendship, to give love to somebody. God's put opportunities in front of you right now. Don't waste those opportunities. Use them for the Lord. Give, win souls, teach somebody, encourage somebody, serve the Lord, love people, and do it today. Today. Hi, everybody. This is Tim DeVries, pastor of Vision Valley Baptist Church in Mount Washington, Kentucky. And I want to thank you for watching our YouTube channel today. Our desire is that the world know Jesus Christ as Savior and that in this generation, His people will be faithful uh, courageous, bold witnesses for Him. I want to say to you, if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, God loves you and wants you to know for sure that you have a home in heaven. In order to know for sure you're saved and that you're going to heaven, the Bible tells us we need to know, first of all, that we're all sinners. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because of our sin, we don't measure up to God's glory. God is perfect and we are not. And sin keeps us out of heaven. Secondly, the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death. 
The Scripture says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Revelation 20, 14 and 15 says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You're going to spend eternity somewhere. And because of our sin, we don't deserve heaven. Unfortunately, we deserve a devil's hell. But the good news is this, that God loves us. And because He loves us, He made one way of salvation. It's not through a church. It's not through a religion. It's not through doing the best works you can do. The only way He made to get to heaven is through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Me. And in Acts 4.12, the Scripture says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus came to this earth. He was born. He lived a perfect, sinless life. The Bible says in Romans 5.8, But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus took our place on the old rugged cross. He was crucified, buried, and rose again to pay for our sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus today offers you a free gift. That gift is eternal life, heaven instead of hell. And if today you're willing to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you're willing to call on Him today to save you, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10.13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you call on the Lord Jesus Christ right now to be your Savior? If you will, He promised He would save you. Feel free to contact us with any questions. We want to help you grow in your walk with Jesus Christ. God bless you.